Right. Uh, I want to say more about that in just a moment. But let me begin by just saying a word of welcome. Man, so glad you're here. Uh, welcome to Central. Hey, if you're on any of our campuses, uh, welcome to Central. And uh, we had an absolute first. We had a campus pastor give birth this past weekend. And uh, Kate and uh, her husband, Brandon, gave birth to a little girl. And bless you guys in Tempe. We uh, rejoice with you guys. And uh, uh, God is just good. So if you're uh, on any of our campuses, hi. If you're watching online, wherever you are in the city, the country, or the world, man, it's good to have you with us. Uh, so we're going to be in Acts chapter 10. So if you would just take a moment, uh, find Acts chapter 10 in your Bible. Always encourage you to bring a Bible. It really will make a difference in you understanding what we're talking about. While you're finding Acts chapter 10, let me just let you know. So we've been in a series um, that we call Love Beyond. And uh, this is a number of times now uh, through the years that we've done a series. We change it up every time, but it's the same theme because it's kind of the theme of our church, if you haven't figured that out yet. So what you just heard was a song that was uh, written and produced and, you know, sang and whatever, uh, all parts of it from our worship team. Well, they recorded that and uh, it dropped this week on uh, all the major music platforms. And so I'm telling you that to say, I'd encourage you to get online and uh, get, get a hold of that and uh, uh, use it as background music uh, as you're as you're doing your devotion in the morning or as you're driving to work or as you're having your first cup of coffee, whatever it is that you do, whatever your routine is. And I think that uh, the, getting that kind of in your head would be a really, really good thing. So we've been in this series for uh, a, about nine weeks now. We have about three weeks to go. And I, I want to just make sure that through it all, uh, we don't lose the plot. Now, we've been talking about how, how to take love seriously to people. I mean, like, how do we seriously... Uh, apply the, the idea that Jesus said, this will be the way that will set you apart from everybody else. You're going to love like nobody else does. Now, the truth is, we know we don't do a really good job with that as Christians. We're not seen as loving people. So whatever we think we're doing right, we're doing it wrong because if we were doing it right, the world would go, those are the most loving people we've ever seen. Well, that's not our reputation. And I'm not talking about Central particularly, I'm talking about the church at large. We, we're doing something wrong. So what we're doing is going through the book of Acts. Acts is the story of the early church. The early church absolutely rocked the world. And we're trying to figure out what did they know that we seem to have forgotten? What did they know that we didn't get? And so each week we're taking it. Now, I want to take you back to the first week to make sure that we don't lose the plot uh, of what is actually happening. It, it, it was all set up in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And, and you might remember how uh, these, these words were where we launched the thing. Jesus said this, um, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and, and you're going to be my witnesses. And you're going you're gonna to do that. You're going to do that in Jerusalem. That's a city. Uh, Judea is an area. Samaria is a wider area and at the ends of the earth. Uh, Jesus said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go tell everybody and uh, be a witness, okay, and testify. Now, I don't know if you have been paying attention, but through the book of Acts so far, we're in the 10th chapter today, and um, uh, all, all through it, man, thousands of people are coming to faith in Jesus. There were 3,000 men one time, 5,000 men. I, I gotta remind you that when the Bible counts men, you, you got don't get upset over that. It was a different day and was politically correct at the day was to just count the men. That was men, women, and children, but they didn't count the women and children. Again, don't get hung up on that. It was the PC of the day. So when it says 5,000 men, there was a whole lot more people. The church launched and people were coming to faith all over the place, all right? Now, what you probably haven't noticed, and I have not pointed out because I didn't want to point it out until we got to this week, that of all the thousands of people who came to faith in Jesus in the book of Acts, chapter one through chapter nine, they were all Jewish converts. It, it was simply Jewish people coming to faith in Jesus. It, it was Jewish people who had uh, looked for the Messiah, didn't understand Jesus was the fulfillment of that, and then came to faith in him. And uh, you, I mean, again, there's a couple of you could say like, well, okay, what about that Ethiopian eunuch? We talked about that guy a couple of weeks ago. Uh, uh, there's no reason to believe he wasn't Jewish, even though it doesn't say he was Jewish, but he was coming from Jerusalem back down to Ethiopia. He was on the road and he was reading the Old Testament Jewish scriptures. Okay, he's probably Jewish, most likely. Um, we could talk about a guy in the eighth chapter of Acts we didn't talk about, a guy named Simon the Sorcerer, uh, interesting cat, but he was trying to buy the power of the Holy Spirit. He never converted. He was just corrupt. It's a story of that. So every conversion in the book of Acts up to this point is, is of a Jewish person. Now, you got to ask yourself the question, why is that? Is it because only Jewish people have uh, uh, you know, God's interests? Uh, only 
Uh, only people who have Jewish descent are of any interest to God. Uh, and you go, okay, well, that's going to be problematic as you think about it. And we're going to think about that, all right? Why, why did only Jewish people convert? And here's why. Because the early church only associated with Jewish people. That's why. And in fact, if you put it in a principle, you could say this. No conversions occurred because no conversations occurred. There's just no record of anything. They hung out with themselves. They hung out with people they were comfortable with. They understood Judaism. They understood that. And so they just hung out with people who got that. And then they would tell them about Jesus and the old covenant is the foundation of the new covenant. And so people would go, I get it. I see now Jesus is the Messiah. They only talked to people who were like, that. I don't know. What, what is going on? It, it's, it's kind of hard to wrap your brain around, but I encourage you, wrap your brain around this. The, uh, the problem was that somehow they must have assumed that Jesus didn't die for them. He, he died for us, the Jewish nation and converts out of Judaism, but he didn't die for those people, those, you know, those outsiders, those other people, those, those people that are not like us. He, he didn't, you know, I don't know, he didn't value them, he didn't want them, he didn't desire them, he didn't die for them, he died for us. It's as if they reached the conclusion that all the good things of God were reserved just for them and them alone. They're the, you, you see, they're outsiders, but we're insiders. We have access, they, they are excluded, they are not part of us. Now, <clears throat> I want to take this a step further. Um, it, it is as if, um, as if somehow as they looked at these people, they, they were just acting out what they really believed. I don't know how else to say it. They believed the outsiders were unclean. They felt they were filthy. They, they were, what well, they called them Gentiles. Now, that's not a word you hear often. It was a derogatory term. It was, there were the Jewish insiders and the Gentile it would be like in our day calling someone a pagan. They were the pagans, which is not a compliment, by the way. Somebody calls you a pagan, you just probably didn't pay attention, okay? Or, or they're just a bunch of heathens. It was a pejorative. It was a put down. They're Gentiles, and, and the, there was a contempt toward them. They, they are not of us. We are the insiders. We are the chosen ones. It's as if... It says we convinced ourselves that eternal life was for us and us alone. Didn't include them. Even in spite of the fact that Jesus made it really, really clear. His last words is recorded in Matthew. We've talked about this many times. called the Great Commission. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of Jewish people around the world. Is that what he said? No. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. What do you mean all the, Not them. Yeah, even them. All nations. They're all included in the offer of salvation. Okay, that's a bit mind-blowing, but that's how it works. Now, I, I want to remind you of something else we talked about a couple of weeks ago. We talked about the fact that, um, that God orchestrates appointments between you and people, and people in you. That, that there is some hand of God that... Uh, kind of calibrates your calendar with somebody else's calendar when he wants you to have a conversation with them. I, I don't know how much God does this, but there's all kinds of evidence. And a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about this, we were talking about Paul, one of our pastors, got up and he remember told the story about he was going to the dentist and uh, he ended up having to go back to the dentist four times and his uh, crown had cracked and the dentist said, I've never seen a crown do this. And Paul finally, four times later, says, can I explain to you why this has happened because I really believe God wanted me to share something with you. And remember that whole conversation? You see, what God does is, is he orchestrates meetings with you and somebody. And, and, and what will happen is if you don't take the call, he's going to repeat it and repeat. And finally, may he, I don't know, maybe he just goes, you're just not getting, you're not going to do it. And he'll use somebody else. I don't know. But what you have here in Acts chapter 10 is an incredibly cool story because this is a divine appointment God orchestrated in as clear of a way as you could possibly see it. And, and the point of it is that um, um, this thing that you think is yours is not yours alone. Now, now let's go to Acts chapter 10. I'm going to move very quickly. This is a text I don't need to spend a lot of time on, 
I, I, we, we're going to read, we're going to pretty much read Acts chapter 10 because it just explains itself, but I'll kind of fill in some of the spots that might be a little bit, I don't, don't quite understand, but let's just jump in there. Okay, so Acts chapter 10, uh, verses 1 to 8. We're going to pick up some people and some places here that we need to understand. At Caesarea, uh, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all of his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need, and he prayed to God regularly. Well, one day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered. Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. Now when the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He, he, uh, he, he told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Okay, so we got to meet a couple of people here. The first guy we got to meet is Cornelius. The thing you need to understand about Cornelius is he's a soldier. We know he's a soldier. He's a Roman soldier. He's a centurion, which means he's a commander over 100. He, he's not the highest ranking soldier by any means, but he's not just a soldier. He's a commander, and uh, this guy is, you know, uh, an important guy. But he, because he's Roman, and a Roman is the occupying force of the, in the land. The, the, the Romans had power over the Jewish nation, and, and you got to understand something. This is important. The Jewish people detested the Romans. They couldn't stand the Romans, and, and, and in all fairness, the Romans couldn't stand the Jews either. It was a mutually dissatisfying relationship, and, and they were constantly at each other. Um, but Cornelius, this one Roman guy, was different it says a couple things about him. He was devout, he was God-fearing, he was a generous giver, and he prayed fervently. He prayed consistently. Now, maybe he attended the synagogue. Uh, maybe he had a little bit of insight uh, about, uh, because we know that he was respected by Jewish people, because he's going to say that in just a moment. H how did he get there? I don't know. But there's no indication he's Jewish whatsoever. He's a Roman soldier assigned to be in a particular place on the planet. Now, the second guy we're going to meet is Peter. Peter is the exact opposite of Cornelius. Peter is an, uh, is an Israeli. He, 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 is, he is a Jewish man. He, he, uh, he is, okay, now get this, as far out, outside is Cornelius, he is inside. You see, he's one of the, he's one of the apostles. He's one of, the, he's one of Jesus. In fact, Jesus had an inner circle of apostles. The inner three with Peter, James, and John. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane? You guys come further in with me. They were inside, inside, inside. Cornelius was outside. And so God's going to bring an outsider in the presence of an insider and an insider in the presence of the outsider, and it's going to get interesting. And by the way, there was also another soldier, a devout sol a servant, a uh, soldier uh, of Cornelius, and two other servants that he sends to go get Peter. Okay, now, again, just show you, this is a real place, real people, okay, real things are happening. Uh, there, I'm going to bring a map up. Uh, this is Israel, okay, and this is in the time of Jesus. Uh, the circle at the top is what's called Caesarea, um, and various names, Maritima, Caesarea, Palestine, Caesarea by the sea. It's contrasted to another place farther north and to the east called Caesarea, uh, by, uh, Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea by the sea is a very prominent port in the time of Jesus. It is the Roman provincial capital. It's where Herod had a palace. It's where, in the book of Acts, Paul's sent to you know, have conversations with Romans. Uh, it's in that, that palace there. It's a beautiful, uh, both of these cities are beautiful port cities. Uh, and today you can go and, and we've done that a number of times. It's just beautiful, beautiful. Now, uh, Joppa is 32 miles down south. Uh, Joppa is famous because of a guy named Jonah, you remember it was Joppa that he hit uh, a ship and went off and had the adventure of his lifetime. Joppa, by the way, is probably, and I'm doing this from, I'm, I'm in my head, two miles south, at most, I think two miles south of present day Tel Aviv, just to give you an idea of where we are on the map. And uh, Peter is down there. He's staying at the house of a guy uh, that Cornelius finds out about because the angel said he's staying at a place, his guy's name's Simon the Tanner. 
And so you'll, you'll find them there. Now, I want to show you something. Now, this gets a little ahead of our story, but there's a detail in here that you just don't want to miss. Yeah, let me show it to you. In Acts chapter 9, it sets up chapter 10, but it says this in Acts 9, 43. It'll come up on the screen here. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Now, you can just blow by that sentence, but he stayed in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. It's the same name, but he's a what? He is a, a tanner. What does a tanner do? A tanner would be uh, maybe in our equivalent of a taxidermist. It's a guy that works with dead animals. He, he skins dead carcasses. Now, if you know anything about Jewish laws, you know that dead animals and Jewish people don't really go together well. Like, that's not cool. And so this is a guy who probably has a deer on his wall that he mounted and there's an elk and that's a, yeah, that's a gazelle. I don't have any idea what he had on his wall. I just need you to understand, Peter would have walked in and saw that, seen that and just said, are those, are, the, are those dead? Like, what are you doing? Because Jewish people have nothing to do with that. But he's staying with the guy. Uh, just an, in, an interesting little tidbit for what's about to happen. You need to understand. P Peter is probably going, that's the grossest thing I think I've ever seen. I can't even believe. And by the way, if you've ever been around any of this, there's a distinct smell that goes with it. Just so you know, it's important. Let's go to Acts chapter 10, verses 9 to 16. Now we're back in the narrative, all right? So Cornelius has this vision. He sends his guys down the, the, down the and by the way, 32 miles takes a little bit of time in the day. You don't catch a plane. You don't catch a bus. You don't catch a, a ride. You, don't hit, you, you walk. Okay, that's kind of how it works. So about noon the following day, because that's how long it took, all right? About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, now Peter went up on the roof to pray. He's at Simon the Tanner's house. He's up on the roof, and they have flat roofs, and it would be a place of privacy. He goes up. To pray. Now, it became, he became hungry, and he wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. Now, I don't know how you get when you're hungry. You get hangry. I don't know what your deal is. But he's like, he's really hungry. And I don't know if he yelled down. I don't know if he went down and said, hey, can we cook something? So something's cooking, okay? Something's cooking. And so he's smelling that. And it says that he, he kind of falls into a trance. In his trance, now we're going to see what he saw. He saw, okay, heaven opened. And something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals. Why is he thinking about animals? Any guesses? Because he's staying at the Tanner's house. There's animals everywhere, probably. So uh, the sheet comes down, all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice said, his first reaction, like, gross. That is gross. All those animals, they're unclean. Then a voice said to him, get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Every hunter's dream words from God. All right? Right there. Get up and kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. You know what's in that sheet? There's a bunch of filthy animals in that sheet. There is no way I'm... Uh, Peter replied, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Well, that's confusing. What do you mean? These animals? This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back into heaven. It, it, it happened three times. No, let, let, let's, okay, so he's on the roof. These guys are getting really close, okay? He goes into a trance. He has this vision of these animals, and the voice says, kill and eat. He's going, that's disgusting. There's no way I'm going to do that. And then God says, what I say is clean. You don't have the right to say is unclean. And then he repeats it three times, which is always the pattern for Peter. Peter is always repeated in three. Peter, you're going to deny me. Not once, three times. And he did. And then in the rest restoration of Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? You know I love you. Three times. Three times. He's not the quickest student, all right? Not that quick. All right, now let's go to Acts 10, 17. Now, while Peter, and this is cool, you ever come in, a, uh, you ever come like, you know that twilight? I know you do. The twilight between sleep and like being fully aware, that twilight. While Peter was wondering 
uh, about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped by the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. Now, while Peter was thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. And so get up, go downstairs, do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Now, the first thing you need to go, when he goes down, he's going to see they are not dressed as Jewish people. They are dressed as Romans. So Peter goes down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why are you here? What do you want? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. And holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. This is a divine appointment. Peter, I need you up in Caesarea. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. Now, I just want to go on record. This has got to be the weirdest day in the life of Peter. I mean, the, the crucifixion was a really weird day, but now he's like going, man, this is strange. I've, I've never seen, and I've never, at, and, and at the voice, and it was an angel, and I'm so thoroughly confused. Weird day. Let's keep going. Acts 10, 23. Well, the next day, Peter started out with them. They're going to go up to Caesarea. And some of the believers from Joppa went along. So Peter gets a couple of friends because, hey, you don't know about these Roman people. I need some peer support. Uh, the following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them. Of course he was, because an angel said to go get him. So he wasn't assuming that Peter would say no, although Peter could have said no. But he thought better of that. So he was expecting them. Now, don't, don't miss this. And he had called together his relatives and close friends. Hey, I got everybody's waiting for you, Peter. We're so excited to hear what you have to say. Now, now catch this next line. It's really, really important. As Peter entered the house... That's just an innocent sense. You just blow by that sense. Peter entered the house. No, 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 no. You got to stop. You got to understand something. He is a Jewish man who does not go into the house of an unclean Gentile. He is an insider with God. He is an outsider with God. There is a line called the threshold. There is a barrier. I will talk to him, but I will stay out here. You bring him to the door. So Cornelius comes to the door. And then Cornelius invites him in, and he has to make a decision, just like you have to make a decision on every line, every limit, every barrier, the, every fence post you want to put out there as to who's on the other side of who's in and who's out. Who's the other? So he has to make a decision. And he's like, I don't know, man, all kinds of weird things are happening. I don't know, kind of weird. I don't know, is this something about clean and unclean? I think maybe I'll just go, I'm going to go check it out. This is all weird. He goes inside the house. That's what it says. Now, something weird's going to happen. Uh, as soon as he goes inside, as Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet in reverence, but Peter made him get up, stand up. He said, I'm a man just like you. Cornelius is going, I can't believe you came. This is so incredible. I am so grateful. Uh, while Peter was talking with him, now watch this, while, while talking with him, excuse me, Peter went inside, now n n he, he was inside, he was inside the threshold, and my friends and family are in the family room, come in there. That's like going really deep into your Gentile house, and he goes and he decides, I'm going to go in there. So he goes inside, found a large gathering of people. He said to them, and don't miss this because this is so good. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. Do you know how wrong this is? That I'm in this room, in this house, with you across the other side of the line. Do you know how? But God has shown me, he said, this is his takeaway. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask you why you sent for me? This is incredible. It's just absolutely incredible. If Peter would say what he's thinking, this is what he'd say. You all disgust me. You all just literally make me sick to my stomach. Why don't you just get out of our country? Why don't you just get on a boat and leave. Why don't you, and by the way, you, you look weird to me. You dress weird. You cook weird. You cook weird food. 
everything about you is wrong. That's what the bubble in his head. You know what that's talking about? Little thing, he's thinking. But he's, uh, he's under conviction of God. God's going, don't you dare. Don't you dare put these people down. I'm saying they're clean. Don't you dare bring your bias against them into this conversation. That's tough, tough on Peter. Acts 10, 34. Then Peter began to speak. Now watch this. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Can, can I just point this out? We believe to the core of who we are that God does show favoritism. He favors insiders. He favors certain people from certain countries. He favors certain skin tones. He favors, it's just not true, but we believe it because somehow someone got to us and put it in our head that we're clean and they're unclean, whoever and whatever. And we think God's on our side. It's just the tendency that we all have. Now, don't get offended. Just keep your mind open because maybe God wants to show you and me something here. Because Peter's going, I don't know, man. I always thought God showed favoritism. I thought we were his favorites. And I'm just getting, a, like, I'm getting this really weird thing happening where, like, I'm starting to see, hey, maybe I got this wrong. Um, where am I? Uh, and does what is right. So you know the message God has sent to the people of Israel. Now, here's what you need to understand. I'm going to do this fast. Peter is confused. He's in a place he's never been. He's with people he's never hung out with. And he senses God is trying to tell him something. So you know what he's going to do? He, you know what he's going to do? He's going to take all the tribal knowledge that he has of God, all the insider's uh, point of view, and he's going to just throw it out there. He's going to literally cast these incredible pearls of wisdom in front of these people because he senses God's telling them, uh, you need to treat these people with dignity and tell them what you know. So he's going he's to open the playbook. He's going to reveal everything. Now, with that understanding, let me just sh show you, and I'll go fast, what he said. Um, he, so he, uh, let me back it up here. Uh, you know the message that God sent to the people of Israel, our, 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 me, uh, insiders, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know that uh, what has happened throughout the province of Judea, uh, beginning in Galilee, uh, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, uh, the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything. Okay, we saw it. All right, we're, we're here. I'm, I'm testifying um, that he did in the country uh, to, in, in, of the Jews and, and, and in Jerusalem. Now, they killed him. Uh, by hanging him on a cross, who's they? He's not saying we killed him. He's saying they killed him. So could be implicating the Jewish people. He could be implicating the Romans. He doesn't say you killed him. They killed him by, the, by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. And all the prophets testify about him and that everyone who believes in him uh, and, and that everyone who believes. And, and I'm supposed to tell you that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his names. Oh, please, God, not even them, not even these, not these people. Not these people. Acts 10 44 says, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on those, all those who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter, his Jewish insider friends, were astonished. You have got to be kidding me. You have God, you have got to be kidding me. These guys get what we got. They get the blessings you gave us? You're giving it to them? They were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. Astonished? Even on Gentiles? Even them? They get this? You've got to be kidding. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And Peter said, well, hey, why not, man? Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So they said to Peter, uh, they, they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. That's a whole nother dilemma. Are you going to sleep in that house, Peter? 
I suspect he did. All right? And it never occurred to them that God would give away his good grace upon these filthy Roman Gentiles. And by the way, the rest of the story is in Acts 11. I don't have time to read it. The rest of the story is just by the way, because it's how it always works. The rest of the story, Peter gets back with his own crowd, and they go, what in the world did you do? We heard what you did. We heard that you baptized. We heard that you, well, you gave away the playbook. And they literally light into him. This is Acts 11, the first. But let me show you how, it, how that ends, about verse 15. I'll pick it up. Peter gets up, and he says, okay, calm down. Just calm down. He said, look. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. And then I remember what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave to them the same gift that he gave us who believed in the, Spirit, in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? Do you understand what he's saying? If this is what God wants, if God wants to welcome those people in, who do I think I am to say they're not welcome? That's what he's wrestling with. So when they heard this, I love this. They had no further objections and praised God saying, so, so then even the Gentiles, God has granted repentance, even to the Gentiles. God has granted repentance that leads to life. We thought it was ours, ours alone. We thought it was just for us. So apparently God has bigger vision. He has a bigger plan. Can I sum all this up? Listen very carefully. This comes from Paul in the book of Galatians. There is no longer Jew or Gentile. Please, please listen to these words. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. You understand what we're doing here? We're talking about people we hold biases against, not them. They don't get this. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are true children of Abraham. You are his heirs. And God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. That is mind-blowing. He goes, you know what? Everything that we've held near and dear to our hearts as Jewish people now belongs to you. Our father Abraham is now your father Abraham. The blessings of the patriarchs that we've held so tight now include you. This is mind-blowing, but you're included. By the way, the big idea of this whole message, if you haven't figured this out, the job of all Christians is to help outsiders become insiders. God's love is for all. It's not just for some. It's for all. Now, I want to make this very personal as we close. The story of Acts chapter 10 is about a person named Peter having to overcome a bias towards somebody who he had no respect or love for. Are you biased against anybody? Am I biased against anybody? This is what you got to ask yourself at this moment. Okay, this is the application, folks. This is the thing that can change your life. When you take something you learn from God and you start asking yourself hard questions, is it me, Lord? Is it me? Are you biased? Am I biased? Um, and by the way, the more you want to say, just so you know, the more you want to go, I am absolutely not biased. I'm the least biased person I've, you've ever met. I don't know anyone less biased than I am. You know what you're suffering with? It's called self-serving bias. This is too good to be true. I mean, this is funny. See, self-serving bias is when you think you're the exception to everything. You think it doesn't apply to you. You think you're, you're better than everybody. Do you have biases? And the answer is yes. Do you want to deal with them? Or do you just want to pretend like you don't have them? You have biases. And the question I just am asking is, who? Who is it for you? Um, for me, it might be different. It probably is different. Who it is that you... And by the way, let me just give you a definition of a bias, a couple of definitions. A personal and sometimes unreasoned judgment. A personal and sometimes unreasoned, usually unreasoned. Do you ever, like, I don't know, let me make this a real simple illustration. Do you ever, like, see somebody who they buy a new car and that bubble in your heads, you're going, why did you buy that? brand of a car. That's the worst car out there. You ever done that? Somebody buy, I don't want to mention any cars because I'll just offend somebody and it's not necessary. But I'll tell you what, some of you buy a car and I go, well, why did you buy that? Because I just think that's a dumb choice. And then I want to go, and you got it in that 
color? Gotta be kidding me. Like, you'll never sell that thing. Uh, that's just that's just uh, that's just an unreasoned judgment. It's just I, I don't like that, so you shouldn't like that. Although it was your favorite choice and it was your favorite color, it's not mine. Here's another definition: to give a settled and often prejudiced outlook towards someone or something. You ever do that? Prejudice? You know what prejudice means? Prejudge. I don't know, but I'm pretty sure I'm aware. I don't know for sure. I don't know you, but I know your kind. Your kind is, and then you fill in the blank. Here's the third one. Biases or assumptions or beliefs or attitudes we hold towards others, often unconsciously. You, you know, I, I just tell by your look. I know all about your character. I know by, because, and your look can be any number of things. It could be the color of your skin. It could be the, I don't know, the way you dress. It could be the way you carry yourself. It could be the words you use. I, just, I know all about your character. I know all about your intentions. I, I can read your values just this fast. I know exactly what matters to you. I know about your morals, and I can tell by what you're doing. I, I can assess your intelligence just this you see, we, Nobody wants to come out and own this, but this is what we do. We got it all figured out, and it only took us a few seconds because we're really good at this. And we just put somebody in a box. You ever been put in a box before? Ever been the recipient of somebody's bias against you? You go, why would they be biased against me? I don't know. But they can be if you don't fill in their boxes. Uh, there's a guy that comes to this church. His family comes here. And um, I love this guy. I uh, uh, this, was talking to him the other day. And um, he uh, was, uh, we were talking about, he was telling me about something that happened in his past. And I, I just said, man, that, that's fascinating. Is there any way I could get you to just kind of share that with the entire church? And he's like, a little reluctant, but he said, yeah, I'll do that. Um, <clears throat> I want you to hear um, this guy's story. He's one of us, just so you know. He's an insider. I grew up in Scottsdale and uh, had great Christian parents who raised us uh, as church-going family. We were regular attenders at church. Well, we were taught you should, you, we all live in the world, but you should not live of the world and be of the world. We were kind of taught to avoid behaviors that the world was familiar with. And so that's the way I was raised. There was a neighbor who lived about six houses up the street, and I would see this guy come walking by, you know, occasionally, and he had longer hair, and I, I think he even had a skateboard, you know, sometimes. You know. One day, he rang my doorbell, and I, I answered the door, and he had a baseball glove in his hand and a baseball. He's tossing it up, and he goes, hey, I see you guys playing down here all the time. I, I wonder if you want to come out and play catch. And I just kind of sized him up. You know, and his hair was longer. He was kind of a free-spirited guy. And, and uh, you know, we were maybe freshmen in high school at that time. And I just said, he, he, he looks like one of the worldly type, you know. I, he probably doesn't have the same standards I have. And, and I looked at him, and I, I wanted God to be proud of me, being separate from the world. And I go, you know what? I think not. And I pretty abruptly shut the door. And I watched him walk off uh, back down the street to his house. I would end up seeing that guy again. I ended up, you know, running cross country with him in high school. But uh, I left the state of Arizona after high school and went to college and then came back to Arizona 32 years later. So my wife and I were church shopping as we came back to the valley here to live. And uh, one day we were staying in Mesa at the time. We, ha we happened down Lindsay and, you know, we saw a church sign that said Central Christian. Pastor Cal Jernigan. I had to grab the steering wheel. I about drove off the road and I told my wife, you know, I, she goes, what's going on? And I said, I knew a Calvin Jernigan in high school. She goes, well, it's probably the same guy. I go, it, it wouldn't be the same guy. And uh, she goes, well, we should check it out on Sunday. And so sure enough, we, we were there uh, the very next Sunday and uh, I got to renew my acquaintance with my old friend, Cal Jernigan. I realized that I had not been a very good example of loving beyond back in that day because Cal was the guy who rang my doorbell and I gave him a pretty abrupt, I think not. Probably the most ironic thing is, you know, he had his baseball glove and baseball. I'm a baseball guy. I played since I was seven years old, 44 years. I was a high school baseball coach and, you know, he, he, he had the sport I loved right there and I still, you know, the lines were drawn and it was like, too big of a commitment to cross, cross over and, you know, and, and associate with this guy that I didn't know and didn't feel like you know, we were like each other.
there's just so many opportunities to reach out. So, you know, I, I would just challenge anybody who was raised like I was raised and those lines are so drawn to, you know, go live life, but, but be an example to them and, and you know, engage them about Jesus if you can. So. What? What a jerk. I had just uh, moved to uh, Scottsdale from Albuquerque, and I didn't have many friends. I didn't know if I had any friends. I saw him down the street playing ball with some guys once, and I thought, oh, why not? He really said, I think not. That's what he said. <laughs> I'm sure walking back dejected, I'm going, who says I think not? Who says that? Anyway, we've become really good friends. And now, uh, and for the last, gosh, decade plus, he's come to Central and we've laughed about that. He walks up to me now and I go, hey, think not. You know, it's just kind of, <clears throat> but you know what? Um, Rick didn't lead me to the Lord. And I understand his apprehension because I was everything he described. I had much longer hair than you saw in those pictures. And I was a free spirit. And I was uh, kind of a wild guy uh, because that's all I knew. And that was my life. But Rick didn't lead me to the Lord um, because he thought not and somebody else did. And the question is, is who is God bringing in your circle? Uh, I mean, how much more can you cue it up than a guy knocking on your door with a baseball going, hey, you wanna play catch? Um, how, how does God communicate to you that it was you? It was your moment, it's your moment. So all these bulbs that are in the lobby uh, on all of our campuses, those names, how, what do you want God to do? How does God have to cue it up? so that you'll understand it's you that's supposed to lead them to Jesus. How's that supposed to happen? Um, look, I don't know where you picked up your biases. Uh, and by the way, I've been thinking about this. I think you can get them from your parents. I think you can get your biases from your friends, from school, university, wherever you go. I think you can certainly get it from society. But tragically, you know where you get some of your biases? You get them from the church that you attend because we love to explain that God's for us, but not for them. And all of a sudden you can start getting an attitude towards anybody outside. So let me close this by, I wanna show, um, show you a passage that I think, uh, you see in Acts chapter 10, don't miss this. There is a monumental shift now in the story and the trajectory of the church because Cornelius is going to receive Jesus. And, and, and you know what? Cornelius is going to go back home to Rome. And um, I don't know. He settled out settled from that port right there where he lived, got on a boat and went home. Who knows who he told? Paul is going to get sent to Rome out of that port. Maybe Cornelius and Paul had conversations. And I don't know if you know this, but Rome is the capital of the Catholic world today. Do you know this? Vatican. Uh, coincidence? I don't, I don't know. Ephesians 2.11 says, Therefore remember, you, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth, that's me, and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, the insiders, and you are the outsider, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in heaven, you're an outsider, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, not for you, they're for us. Without hope and without God, sucks to be you. You have nothing of value. Without hope and without God in the world. But now, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who are once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Guess what? I used to be an outsider. Now I'm an insider. I'm inside the faith. Many of you are also insiders, but you know what your job is? The job of all Christians is to help outsiders become insiders by telling them that God loves them, just like he loves us. Now, when you walked in, you were handed this and this, and you're going, well, what's that for? 
This is for you to get really personal with God, if you choose, and I pray you choose. You know, as I've been talking, my guess is somebody's come to your mind, somebody. Now, it could be an individual that you go, they don't belong, they shouldn't, I don't like them. These people are unfit for the kingdom of God. I don't know how you say it in your head, but they, oh, I hope God doesn't forgive them. Could be a person. Oh, God, not that guy, not that guy, not her. Oh, please, not her. It could be you, by the way. You could hold more contempt about, you could hold yourself in more contempt than you hold anybody else. You can't stand yourself more than you can't stand anybody else because you're so disgusted with yourself. Yeah, you see, the great news is, is Jesus Christ died so that those people can have what you've been given in Christ, including you. So what I'm going to do to close is I'm just going to give you a chance to purge, purge the bias out of you by going, God, I just acknowledge it's them. You see, God's never going to be able to heal you of that bias and give you to understand how he loves those people until you're willing to admit you're standing in the way and you won't cross the line. You put a boundary marker up. So I'm going to pray, and then this is how we're going to do this. I encourage you to write the name of a person, the name of a group, whatever, however, maybe your own name. And the idea being that uh, as soon as uh, I get done praying, they're going to put a cross right here, just a little cross. It's going to go right there. And then we're going to invite you to walk up here and um, give your bias, give your contempt to God. And go, God. I need, I need cleansing. I need, uh, God. It's me. I got this thing against them. It's not going to make it go away, by the way, just because you did that. But acknowledging a problem is the first step to solving a problem. And so what will happen is it'll happen here. And again, that cross will roll out on your stage, uh, wherever you are uh, at home. I, I just ask that you would just do this as best as you can. But what will happen is as you come, and as soon as I get done praying, I invite you to come forward. As soon as I get done praying, you come forward and you give this contempt to God and go, God, I have a problem. They don't have a problem. I have a problem. I have a problem with them. Don't make it about them. It's your issue with them. God, I, I need to give this problem to you. And then what will happen is uh, your campus pastor or who's filling in for your campus pastor will come forward on your campus, and um, we'll close the service by just having a prayer over all of the contempt that we brought into this building, into that building, into your home. And uh, that's how we'll close out this service and ask God to forgive us. God is a God of grace. He's so good. He was so good. He included you. He included you because he wants you to be included in helping other people to be included. So let me pray. So God, we do ask that you would just be with us right now. Help us to be honest. Help us to not uh, show contempt even in the moment of trying to cleanse us of contempt by catching an attitude. God, I pray that you would just allow us to release uh, our prejudice that we carry, that we hold uh, against whoever. It's different for all. But God, I pray that you would just allow us to just say this has got to go. And then do, do the beginning of a work that might take years, but do the beginning of a work to cleanse us of um, what we've been programmed, maybe from our youth, to believe about the people we wrote down. So we give this to you now, God. Do, do a miracle in us, please. We need it. Please cleanse us and transform us. We want to love like you loved. We want to love beyond. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on down.